Good afternoon. I'm Frank Conkling, and this is Panda Consulting's ArcGIS Workshop. And we're back after taking a month off of, of the Independence Day and then the ESRI User Conference. So we're back and ready to start uh, talking again about ArcGIS Pro and ways to go and, and become more efficient in what we're doing there. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, I just want to before we start, we want to introduce, make sure you understand who Panda Consulting is. In the lower right corner of this, you'll see a, a QR code that will take you to Panda Consulting's website, tell you who we are, what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Please feel free to go over there. You'll also find on the bottom of the landing page, the front page, a sign-up sheet for our monthly workshops or our monthly newsletters. And in there is a link for the workshops so you can attend live. Also, just want to go and remind everybody that Panda Consulting is an ESRI silver partner, have been for about 27 years. We also are the first business partner in the United States to receive the parcel management specialty designation, along with our release ready specialty designation and the state and local government specialty designation. So what are we gonna talk about today? Today, we're gonna to look at some tips for making edits easier in ArcGIS Pro. And these are really simple fundamental things, but it's things that we've discovered during all of our testing and getting through all the iterations. We actually started testing ArcGIS Pro in 1.1. And we've picked up little things along the way that sometimes are not obvious if you're just getting involved in and moving from ArcMap into Pro. And I just want to go over these just to make sure that you understand what they do and why they do it and such. All right, so let's get started. So here's just a general list of topics. One is enabling edits so that you can go and start editing and stop editing. Another one is resetting panes for making editing easier so you only see the pains that are involved with editing. And then customizing a quick access toolbar. There's a lot to be gained by going and adding quick, um, quick access toolbar shortcuts. And then another one I picked up recently, using inference and some of the tricks to using inference. And then finally, if we have enough time, we'll go over feature templates. These really can make it very, very helpful when you're editing and setting it up to be as optimized and as efficient as possible. So let's get started. Right now, what we have is the standard ArcGIS Pro. When you open it up, this is what it looks like. And the first thing that we wanna go and talk about is the fact that by default, ArcGIS Pro is always editing, always editing. And there are times when you want to edit, times when you don't wanna edit. Maybe sometimes you, you're just going to go in there and do maybe produce a map or, or do something and explore your data and you don't want to edit. Well, there's a way to go and take that old arc map, start and stop editing and make that available, that functionality available in ArcGIS Pro. So in order to do that, first thing you do is you go to the project tab and this takes you to an area with all sorts of settings on it. And if we go to the options area, you'll see you'll see the list. This is pretty overwhelming when you first get started. And there's a lot of separate things in there. Um, the one that we're going to talk about is under the edit tab. And, and on these options, you're actually, you will see that they are broken down into groupings to try to make it easier so that you don't have to scroll through everything to understand it. The Start editing and stop editing is all is available under the session group. And it's right here at the top. It's enable and disable editing from the edit tab. All right, now when I click that and hit apply, I will now have a new button on my edit tab that says enable edits or disable edits. This is in fact the same functionality as ArcMap had, however, because ArcGIS Pro allows you to edit from more than one source at a time, there's a new option in 3.2 or 
in which it says I can turn editing on for every data source that I have at one time. That's this multiple workspace edit session. That means that if I have data coming from multiple places, turn them all on. Single workspace edit session means turn on one, and then I manually have to go in and stop editing that one and start editing a different one. I almost always use multiple edit sessions on so that if I'm editing, I'm editing anything that I have the ability to go and edit with one thing. While we're here, before we leave, there's a couple more settings here we want to be aware of. One is this next one down, automatically save edits. In ArcMap, we always fought and said we want to go and make sure that we get save at auto save on edits. Um, and while it's a good thing, for those of us that edit a lot of things in here, it becomes a little problematic. You know, if I say automatically turn on edits, that means that every 10 minutes or every however many I set it, intervals, it's going to automatically save. The problem with setting that is that it means that it automatically will save without prompting me. And if I want to go and undo anything, you can only undo up to the most recent save. So if I'm editing and editing and it doesn't tell me that it's saving and it saves and I try to undo it, I'm stuck. I can't undo that save. So often what people will say is that, well, let's turn on auto edits, but then let's also turn on this show the dialog to confirm save edits. And that's a reasonable thing. But if we're doing that, that means that if we're getting this dialogue, are you sure you want to save edits? Are you sure you want to save edits? Well, the reality is if you want to be sure, just turn this all off and do it yourself. I do want to go and warn you, there is another one that can be dangerous and that this, this one here, save edits when saving your project. Um, sounds good. Sounds good, which means there's one less thing you have to do. However, I'm going to show you where that can cause you a problem. If under the general setting here, there is this project recovery, and this is new inside of ArcGIS Pro, this means that I can not just save edits, but I can save a backup copy of my project. So if in fact, I'm spending a lot of time updating and setting up my project and I've got the symbology and the labels and I've got them exactly as I want. And then for some reason, Pro crashes, it actually will save a copy, a, a hidden copy of my project file in whatever setting. And by the way, I keep this as default and I tell every five minutes, just keep a backup copy of wherever the state of my project file is, and this is a great option. I highly recommend you put it on there and it will make sure. And then the next time you come back into Pro, it says, you've got an unsaved copy of your project. Do you want to restore that? And you can say yes, and it will bring it back to that last backup of the project. However, this is where it comes into a problem. When this option here, it says save edits when saving the project. If you have that check, that means that every time your backup copy, that saved backup copy gets set, it will automatically save your edits. Be careful. If you've got one thing set, you want to make sure that maybe you don't have the other one set. All right. Um, so those are my tips on A, enabling and disabling editing from the edit tab, and then whether or not we might automatically want to save edits. Again, we do pretty intensive editing and we know what we're doing. So we usually say, don't save them until I'm ready to save them. Don't, don't make us confirm the saves. Just go and say, yeah, I want to save it. And then turn the save edits when saving the project off so that you don't inadvertently save your edits when a backup copy of your project gets in place.
so Chris, before we leave here, do we have any questions in the chat window? Bernd asked if um, the edit settings are shared with the project or with the program. And Mark very kindly chimed in and uh, relayed that it is the program. They're all yeah. program specific yes. and they're not linked to each individual uh, project that you open. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Thanks, Mark, for, for that. Um, it is. And it's it's one of those things where, again, these are just all sorts of little tips that you can go and do. And it is project independent. So if you set it on here, at least these settings here, if you set them here, um, every time you open Pro, it will, will go and do that. All right. So um, here's another one I use a lot. Make newly added labels, layers editable by default. Definitely, I do that all the time. I have one more that I just thought of that's not on that topic list. And that has to do with this display setting, all right? The display, if I look here in these objects and the display, one of the issues that happens often when people first get involved, they start moving from Map into Pro, Maybe they're doing it on their original machine that they had map on. Maybe they got a new machine and they, they bring it up. But there is something about here that, that for some reason, suddenly they're editing and editing and editing, and suddenly the drawing stops refreshing. They'll make an edit, and then all of a sudden, that edit won't appear. Either they'll delete something and they'll still see it or whatever. Well, it turns out that RTS Pro is caching all of the display. In essence, it's keeping a copy of what it's doing so that you can scroll back very quickly and scroll forward very quickly on it. And what happens is often this display cache, this cache which is stored on your local machine, gets so large that it can't keep up and display fast enough to reflect what's really been, what the latest edit is. And this, what will happen is that when that cache gets too large, and by the way, you'll notice mine right now is about 400, or excuse me, 234 megabytes in size. When you start getting up into gigabytes in size for the cache, it's too big for you, most of your computers to be able to go and display it quickly enough for you to think, oh, this is a live display of what I'm looking at. So, First option, and the one that I use most often, is that right underneath there's a checkbox that says every time the application closes, every time I get out of ArcMap, or excuse me, ArcGIS Pro, empty out my cache. Only display the things in my current session on here. And if you keep that checked, every time you get out of Pro, it'll, re it'll clear out the cache and you'll start again. And the odds are you're not going to have this problem. However, the second option is this option says clear cache now. Well, the reality is it says clear cache now. What's it going to do? It's going to log you out. So it's going to clear it out and then refresh it. So this option does the same thing as this one. And we just prefer that this one here. All right. Those are my tips that, to make editing much easier. Enable editing so that you can do that. Don't do save edits. Go and make sure that your, your project is being backed up all the time. Make sure that your display cache is being cleared out every time you go and leave ArcGIS Pro. Mark is asking if uh, 8.68 gigabytes is a lot for a, a cache <laughs> size. <laughs> yes, Mark, yes. You definitely, uh, uh, unless you're doing this all at one time and you ever see the reason to go all the way back through all of those displays, I would definitely recommend you clear that cache out. Definitely. And, and, and again, what happens is it gets to a point where eventually your, your, your computer can't handle it. It can't display it fast enough and, and having to go through all of those caches and it looks like you'll make an edit and suddenly you'll look like nothing happened. What it it nothing happened. Why? I just deleted that line and it's still there. And that's the symptom of, of what you'll see. By the way, once I went and changed my options, 
once you did that and you go in here and you go back here, look at what happened. Suddenly in my table of contents, I have a tip saying, hey, for you to edit, you, sh you should go and go to your edit tab and enable editing. And sure enough, here I'm on my edit tab now and I have this button that was not there before. To, to, sh to prove it wasn't there, I'll go back to my editing sessions and disable that. We'll go back here. And sure enough, under the edit, that's not there anymore. So let's go back and turn it on again, enable it. And now here is my enable editing. And once I click that, now I'm editing and I'm editing anything that's in my resources. All right. So first tip, enable editing and make sure your options inside there are set correctly. You'll be very appreciative on that. The next thing that we find is that I'm not sure how you've got your pro set up. I know some of our team, I, Chris, especially, we've got your table of contents over on your left. And he, he has, for example, his create features over on the left and other things are over on the right. I tend to just have table of contents there and nothing else on the left. And then I have all the other panes over here. And as you can tell, as you get working with them, they open up and they never close by themselves. Well, again, editing tip. It turns out that there's a setting where you can go and say, I only want the, the panes that are applicable to editing. And that's actually under the View tab. Under View tab, there's this thing called Reset Panes. And if I, it's a pull down. So if I pull it down, I can say, I can reset the panes for mapping, meaning for layouts, or I can reset it for editing, or I can reset the panes for geoprocessing. So if I reset it for editing, suddenly you look, all of those other panes that were open, they're gone. They've disappeared. It's automatically closed them for me. And I only have the panes that are applicable for editing right now. I will mention, um, we are parcel fabric specialists. And even if you have a parcel fabric in your table of contents, unfortunately, it doesn't automatically open up the manage manage records tab and i i strongly recommend to asri that you start including that with the reset panes to editing and just to look to reset it for mapping there's for remapping it that's all that's in there and again i don't have any i don't have a layout here and then resetting for geoprocessing i only get the geoprocessing tabs in here this is this is very handy um, to be honest, I knew about it early on, but I almost always forget where it's located. It's located under the View tab, and it's called Reset Panes. becomes very helpful when you have a lot of panes open and you start figuring out which one of these do I actually need. Second set of tips. Any questions on that? No. Nope. Not currently. Okay. Again, this one... I, I like this a lot. Here's the next the next tip that we use, and this one we're going to take a little bit more time to explore. By default, by default, the, the interface is focused on the ribbon. But those of us that do a lot of editing, we're still used to having, those of us that are, are older, those of us that have been using Map for a long time, we want to see those small icons and something that we can go and use and just quickly click, 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 click. You know, for example, on the tabs, on the edit tab is a cut, copy, and paste. All right, cut, copy, and paste if I have something selected. Let's go and select something here. And then you'll see once I select something. All right, then I'll see copy. And then I'll see paste. Well, that's all that's only available on the edit tab. If I go to, for example, some of my parcel fabric stuff, it's not there. But it is available here on the edit tab. Same way with map, sort of the explorer tool, which is the old find tool, and some of these other things. They're 
they're only on specific tabs sometimes. So we want to find some way to go in and customize this where it makes it easier for you to see and you know consistency where it is. Well, it turns out, and I'm going to clear this, it turns out that up at the top here, this is called the quick access toolbar. The quick access toolbar is always on, always there. And it's got some benefits to it in which I can go into tell, I can tell it, show my quick access toolbar below my ribbon so that there's a small toolbar that's always displayed that automatically shows these icons. And then finally, and this is the best part, I can go and customize this however I want. So I can go down and pull this down and say, customize this ribbon, which by the way, this is customized the full ribbon right below there, customize the quick access toolbar. So here's where we go and we have a chance to customize this. So let's say I want to go in and do a move. And I want to add move to this quick access toolbar. What I do is I find that command either in the regular or popular commands or all commands or everything. And you can put your processing tools up here too. I find the command and I select on it and I say add it. Now, once I add it and I click on it, I can move it up or down. It automatically will go and put that command right right next up to whatever you're selected on at that time. So if I, for example, say I want to go and find the cut command, if I can spell it correctly, C-U-T command, here's my cut command, all right? And I can say, go ahead and move that, and it will move it over here. Then maybe I can say I want to say my copy command. I want to do a copy, copy, and here's where you got to be careful because there are so many copies here. In this case, I think I would just want to make sure, copy them. Maybe this is the one. I don't know. I'll put it here. Oh, that's here. Well, let me go and move this down to here. And when I tell it OK, watch what happens over here. All right. So I tell it, OK, it will go and reset that. And then suddenly I will have all of these, my move command. Here's my cut. There's my copy. Again, since I don't have anything selected, I'll select this. And I might not have taken the wrong cut or anything on there. This is a really nice thing to do to the point where we have gone and taken and developed a toolbar a quick access toolbar that we use and share amongst one another. And we can do that by going to customize tools and then saying, we want to go and import. We want to import a customization project. And let's see here, let's go and get one of mine. So here's my customization project. And I can say, go ahead and replace all the other customizations and add that to my toolbar and it will go and there's all my tools that I use every single day for this. Again, you can, if I go in here and I say customize the ribbon, it will go and allow me to take my customizations and import them if I save them or I can export them and share them with other people. By the way, I share them with most of our clients they, because usually they'll look at my my um, my toolbar and say, wow, where'd you get that? And what is that? And it's like, oh, this is a great way to make you more efficient in what you're doing. So please don't be afraid to go and customize this. This, as Mark told you earlier, this actually is a way to go and customize ArcGIS Pro, and it stays with Pro. It's not project dependent. So it automatically stays with you and you can set it up for everything. And you can see on here, I've got start and stop editing. I've got select, select all the visible features in your display, zoom in, 
clear, traverse, update, cogo, merge, clip, split, divide, measure, all um, align features, edit, vertices, build, extend for the parcel fabric, um, merge points in the parcel fabric, delete, undo, redo, previous extent, next extent, bookmarks, discard my edits, save my edits, or for me, I'm often compacting file geodatabases. I have that also in here. We have a customization file already set up for that. If you would like it, go ahead and shoot me an email um, and you'll get my email out at our website. It says contact us and it'll send it right to me. And I'll go and I'll send you a copy of it. Nothing special. It just takes a little bit of time to go and, and put it together. But definitely, definitely go ahead and start looking at customizing your toolbar to make it more efficient for you. Again, the toolbar can either be above the ribbon. I personally have a problem with this. I want to make this, and, and, and let's just say it, I'm lazy. I want to make it the smaller movements that I have to make. That's how I want to go and do it. Um, the question I, I see, somebody was saying, is there a way to go and make it bigger? At the moment, I don't think there is on here. Um, I don't think there is unless you dig down, but that's a great idea to be able to go and make it bigger for those of us that have uh, screens that it appears very small on there. That's a that's an excellent idea. That's a good idea to go and send it to ESRI. Frank, All the right. second part of that question is, can you have multiple toolbars? No, there's only one quick access toolbar. And currently with this iteration, that's the only thing you have. At the same time, you can see how many tools I have on there, uh, but it is only one. It's also other things like you can't put spaces in there or anything like that. So again, this was never meant to be a full replacement for the Arc Map toolbars, but this is a quick sort of halfway there for you to go and be able to go and customize your, your interface without having to deal with all the other issues. By the way, if you really want to customize your interface, you can go and just reduce the ribbon completely, and that's what you get, all right? The ribbon, one more thing, the ribbon. The ribbon can hide themselves, depends. If I click on one of the tabs, it will expose it, and until I click on something else, all right, and then it will go away, or I can click on one of the tabs and then tell it to pin this open. And then it always has the ribbon open and it has my quick access toolbar there all the way. Again, there's lots of little things you can do with, with this interface, but this is one I found that isn't a lot of, of work to, to go and put in place. And it's it's very customizable for you to go and, and set it up. All Frank, right. before we move on, regarding the question about multiple toolbars. Theoretically, you could create a set of toolbars, export that particular set to a folder on your computer. The only downside is it's not as convenient because you'd have to import that setup every time you want to change toolbars, right? That's that's exactly right. That's But I mean, it is yeah. feasible. It's just not as convenient as uh, having multiple up and running at one time. That's right. And so that when you change whatever function you're doing, um, you would then have to go to customize ribbon and then import that ribbon, that quick access toolbar to go for that function. So maybe you have one set up for projects that are just layout projects, you know, map series, things like that. And then you have another one for editing. Yes, conceivably you can do that. Um, the limitation is you can only have one quick access toolbar accessible and active at any one time. Yes, but that's a that, thank you. That's a great idea if you're going to go and do that. Yeah. All right. So good tips in there. The next tip I have actually concerns something that I know a lot of us aren't using. And I was talking to the developer at the user conference and he's like, I, I'm not quite sure why we haven't gotten more traction with this because this is a really interesting tool and it's called inference. So 
by default, you can go and dynamically define constraints. And, and, and I'll, I'll sort of work through this, what this is. So if I want to go in here and I'm editing and I go to my lines and I want to create a line, okay? I can start the line and I can, wow, my snapping is way out here. Sorry. At 200, no, 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 no. 25 pixels, good. Okay. So if I go in here and I start a line, I can right click and develop certain constraints. So let's say I want to go and constrain this to be only, you know, 500 foot long. And now it's only 500 foot long. That's a constraint. And then I can go back here and I can go over this and I can say I want to be perpendicular here and I can do perpendicular. And then I can go back here and I can say I want to go parallel to this and I can go parallel. However, I cannot go parallel that distance. I have to know what that distance is. So I could click this and then I could click this. Well, inference is a form of dynamic constraint on here so that I can go in here and I can start this. So let's go and turn on inference and, and so you can see it, by the way. It is, it is the one, two, three, fourth button over on the bottom. And there's really not any settings in here. It just says displayed and infer points of intersection for segments when sketching. Inference constraints can be snapped to if snapping is enabled. So if I turn on my inference here, doesn't look like anything happens. But now let me go and do things such as I'm doing this and I go over here and let's just say, oh, look at what happened. And I know it's very, very subtle. There's not, it's, it's tough to discern. But I now have, as I moved over this line here, I now have a line that's parallel to it, a line that's perpendicular to it, and a line that's that distance on there, it automatically infers from whatever I'm on top of parallel, perpendicular, and distance on there without me doing anything, without me going and clicking on anything. So now I can say, that's where I want to go. And since I have snapping on there, I now know that that's the same distance as the other thing. So with inference, I can click on here and say, okay, that's there. And again, if I want to be in the same distance in here, or I can click on here and note, it'll snap automatically to there. Inference will go and allow you to go and use the constraints without you having to automatically right click and tell it what you want to do. It automatically infers those constraints for you. It's a pretty interesting thing, including everything from the distance over there to perpendicular and parallel with it. All right. So again, that's you turn the inference on. It works like that. Or you turn the inference on. Doesn't look like there's much on there, but it's doing a lot of things for you. Let's stop here and let's just show you one more time. If I go in here to line, and I could do line. What happens when I click over here? Suddenly I get my inference. I don't have to do anything else. It automatically has the inference on there and it will go and show me sort of the whole thing there, the distance over there, what's perpendicular, what's parallel. Like I said, it, it was interesting to watch and it now, by the way, it gives me, it's inferring what's perpendicular, what's parallel, and what's the same distance as what I was just on top of. So I can very easily go and build these things without right-clicking or anything else. Just move my cursor over what I want to go and, and infer. There it is there. Suddenly I'm perpendicular, parallel, and that distance on there really really cool editing stuff. I think a lot of us, once we start using it, we'll see this is an amazing thing that quickly goes and allows us 
to start using some of these components on here. Again, it's one that I, because I was old school, I hadn't used it a whole lot, but um, it was, it's something that the more you think about, it, the more you realize that that could come in very, very handy because I am constantly, well, I want it to be this distance. I want it to be this parallel or perpendicular or things like that. This is, again, all you have to do is turn it on. Everything else is preset for you. All right. Simple little trick. Inference. Inference. Cool stuff. Any questions on that? I don't see anything else in here. Not at the moment. Okay. Um, um, I just, we just, any, any idea how I get my create features toolbar back? Setting the option on it to remove it as it's in my way. And now I don't know where it is. Your create features toolbar. I'm seeing. So you're talking about this mini toolbar here. Um, so let's talk about this. This is, used to be called the mini toolbar. All right. There's a couple things about this. One, um, they've got to expand it completely. So if I, by the way, let's go back here to edits. Let's go back to here. So I, I can go in here. When I snap off of editing, it disappears. Disappears for me. However, once I enable editing, that mini construction toolbar that construct features toolbar will always show up but there's some really interesting things if i click on configure what i have is i have the ability to go and tell me tell it where it is so i can tell it i want to put it here i want to put it here i want to put it here these are different sizes different places on here that i can put it maybe i want it to have that medium size on there or maybe I want the smaller size on here. It basically just goes and changes the configuration size of the toolbar. But that one little thing, that clicking in this little configuration here, it gives you the option of where it is. By the way, my personal reference is, I really would like to go and have this up here. I would like to have it up on top here. But again, that's just me. Um, also, show the editing toolbar on the map. Um, if you uncheck this, it will go and allow you to put that off of the actual map display. It won't display it here. It will display it anywhere else. And if you've got multiple screens, you can throw it off on another screen. The question is, how do you get it back? I don't know if, you, if you've if you taken it off there, how you get it back. It might be a setting, um, but I've never done that. So. Sorry about that, if that's where it was. All right. Um, so where else do we go? Oh, feature templates. Feature templates. So let's talk about feature templates. A feature template is what shows up here in the Create Features. It is the configuration for what options you have, what attribution is going to get automatically created, and what tools you're going to be editing. And there's a lot of settings in here. So let's just go and start with here. When I add a layer to my table of contents, um, yeah, I have this here. Let's go and add this one again. When I add this to my table of contents, I automatically, it will bring it in with the default setting all right with the default setting on here and that's fine but there's there might be things i want to do with it for example this this actual data set if i remember correctly has got a field in it i'm looking at the fields view on here of this yeah, it's got a field in here called line type. And I'm going to move that up and I'm going to highlight it just so we can pay attention to it. I'm going to save my changes and then save this. So I now have a line type. Oh, and there's a couple different line types in there. Let's say I want to create 
this so that every time I create a line, I can choose whether it's an X line or a Y line. Well, that's done through creating a feature template. So first let's, let's talk about this. The things that appear over here are the ones that are turned on and editable. So if I turn off this layer here, suddenly everything that was part of this disappears. Um, by the way, I've got this, those line types. So I've got no, no line types at all in here now that have feature templates. There is my one feature template here for that new line that I just created. When you add a layer, it adds a feature type for that default symbology. However, if we wish to go and customize this, and we're going to do that, this is how you do it. Under the Create Features tab, there is a button up here next to the search. This is Manage Your Templates. I'm going to go and pull this over so we can really see what's going on here. Now on here, it lists everything that's in that map. Now, if you have multiple maps, you'll see that you have multiple groupings in here. You can change the feature template in this map and you can change it in a different map. But in this case, it's just here, this one. And we have one here. And let's do this slowly so that you can go and, and, and look through some of the options in here. So here's my template for this. And if I go to properties, I have the ability to go and say, well, what is this thing? Now let's call this demo lines, all right? Demo lines. And there's demo lines is my template now. And I can go to properties and say for tools, what tools do I want to have as part of these lines? And I have, here's the tools that are available. I can have my line tool, my right angle tool, my split tool, my radial tool, my circle tool. Maybe I want circle tool. It turns out these check boxes means it lists that tool for you under here. All right, so if I go over here, it lists it for you under here and the radio button, that's the default tool that it's going to use. So again, I can go and put a couple different tools in here. Maybe I want to be able to do all these really weird ones. Freeform, that one's, that's one I actually might use. So let's go ahead and check those. And let's make our two-point line tool the standard. All right. So now when I go in here and I look at this and go, that's the wrong one. Um, edit here, selectable. Did I, I did it, I think, for the wrong one. Sorry. Trace here. There we go. This is telling me the symbol value is not because of uh, other. All right. So, here is, again, some of the properties are what tools do you want to use? And I then go and tell it what tool I want to go and use when I'm editing this. And it automatically, if you'll note, that's now set to my default. If I go to my tools and say, well, actually, I want that to be my default. When I go in here, note, it changed and automatically selected this one instead of this one. So... In your feature templates, you can tell it automatically, what do I want to set as my default tool that I'm going to be using on these? And which tools do I want available to me? And which tools do I not ever really use? Um, the question often, often asked is, well, can I change the order of them? No, unfortunately, you can't. But those are all the tools that are on here. Maybe I want a streamer on here also. So I go and do that, and there's my tools that are in here, my default and everything else. So think about this. When you are editing, you want to make sure that your tools are available for you.
You still have, by the way, always in your construction toolbar, you still have your, your lines, your right angles, your curves, your traces. Those are always there. So you don't have to worry about it. But these are the individual tools that interact with those. That's tools inside your feature templates. But there's another thing here. I can tell it under my attributes that maybe I want the option to be able to go and set what my line type is. Or maybe I want to go and have the option to go and set my distance. When I click on this, look at what happens. Automatically, my feature template is telling me, oh, when you go to create this, we're going to give you that attribute box, attribute box, and we're going to let you go and define beforehand what that attribute is on here. All right. So again, because of this, I can say this is how I want to go and edit this. And again, because of this symbology here, let's go and, and change our symbology so that it's always there. Our symbology does not have any scales on it. Scales on there. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to create features. And now we can tell it that, okay, here is, this is our, our pull down of the types of lines we have. We can go and create an easement line. There's an easement line and say, well, maybe I want to go and create a plat boundary line here. And there's my plat boundary line. I haven't set the symbology for it, but if I look at these on here, here's my plat boundary line. Here is my easement line. So when I can actually create this, so very easily it can be set up. So again, with my create features right now, I only have one of these. Here's where the power of the feature templates actually come in. What happens if I want to set it up so that not only is it a different display, but I can actually create whole different ones. I can set up a new template. Um, let's go ahead and first do this. Let's go ahead and symbolize this according to. Let's go and symbolize it according to the line type. Here's my line types. Let's go and set them up here. Let's make this a little bit interesting here. And let's make this easement line a dash line. Let's make it gray. All right, let's make this flat boundary a bigger line, make it red. By the way, one of the things, if you look and, and see what I'm actually doing here, uh, internal lot line, when I go and set these, I have auto apply turned on. That's new in 3.3. .3. What a change it makes in the way we're doing things. Um, makes it much easier. As soon as I click on it, it automatically applies, and I'm back here. So now I have symbology for this. Let's go back to my Create Features and go to my Modify, my Templates, and this here. And I can say, go and create templates according to my symbology. That's what this is. And it creates a separate template a separate template for each of these. This is the one that was default, didn't have the symbology on. So let's go and look at this. If I look at easement and look at the properties, here's the tools I can set, which tool is my default. And then the attributes, it automatically set it up for the attributes on there. All right, so now that I've got that set up, now let's go and think about as I'm working and I have to go and do some lines, rather than going and drawing a line and going and attributing it and then going and setting the symbology on here, I can now go in here. And by the way, let's let's turn on influence. All right. 
I can now go and tell it I want to go like this. So I want to go here, and then I want to go up. Oh, it's interesting. Let's go back to this easement line, and it turns out there's another option in our lines, in our active templates. So let's go, and I'll show it to you here. There's options on this so that on the tools at the very bottom it says do you wish to automatically continue rubber banding if you've got a two-point line on here and i could say check this and it automatically will now rubber band as i do this and let's do that on here too so with the two-point this is whether i can densify it if i click on two-point whether i want to continue all right so now let's go in here and I say, okay, let's two point and let's here. There's the inference there. I can go here and then I can go perpendicular to that. I can go, that's the same as this. I can now go over here. Suddenly I'm changing my distance. Did you notice that? When I move my cursor over, it picked up the inference from the thing that I was on top of. So if I want to go the same distance as of a line that I have in there, again, move my cursor over that line and suddenly there's the distance, there's parallel, there's perpendicular to it. So I can very quickly go in here and finish that out. Same way with easements. I can go in here and say, let's go here, go parallel with that. There's the length of that line. There's the length of the line. There's, well, maybe I want to go on that one. It'll go and give me a distance to there. And inference to there. All right. So feature templates are really, really interesting. And if you want to make your editing very, very efficient, what you want to do is think about what tools am I using? What symbology am I using? Do I have to attribute this or can I pre-attribute it? And if you set this up one time, suddenly you can use that all the time that you use that project. Now, this setup is project specific. So it's not something that's with the overall RQS Pro, but the the feature templates are specific to this project. Again, if I go here, let's go to easements and say, okay, easements, what tools are we using? We're not going to use these tools. We're not going to use these tools here. We use that. We'll probably use that. That's good. And suddenly, those are the tools that I have. It's preset me for here. It's preset so that it's now going to go and automatically put easement lines in there. And I can create a separate, a separate template for every single unique set of attribution that I have. Let's go in here and take this and delete that one. I don't want that one there. All right. So we've spent an hour. We've gone through some really interesting tips on how to start making editing much more efficient inside of Pro. You got to leave behind map. You got to leave it behind. But there's things like editing and disabling edits, resetting the panes so you don't have all these extra panes in here. You only get the panes that's related to editing, customizing the quick access toolbar, Using inference, oh, this is one of my favorite tips now, is using inference. It's so easy to set up. And again, all you have to do is move your cursor over it, and suddenly it will show you what's parallel, what's perpendicular, and what's that distance on there. Really, you got to give a shout out to Phil Sanchez and Esri. Good job. And then finally, feature templates. Really nice, nice things to do. All right. Any questions on here? We do actually have a couple. 
All right. Uh, the first two are, do templates override default domains and do templates work with the Traverse tool? And then the third question is, uh, are the templates exportable or importable? I do. So let's start with here. I do not believe these are exportable. However, and this is this is interesting. This is this is three three. This is three three one. Um, I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to re-add this construction line template. Notice it, it's here. One of the really interesting things about 3.3 and one of the things is I, I am constantly setting up and doing all sorts of things for other people, setting them up to try to make their projects more, more efficient. Watch this. If I go in here and right-click on a layer, I can... Where is it now? Where is it? Copy. I can copy that. If I go to another layer, I have this new thing in 3.3 called paste the properties. So if I paste the properties on there, look at what I get. I get those properties in here. Let's turn this one off. Let's turn this one on. Let's go to create. I get my templates. Templates get copied. So it's not just the symbology, but it's the templates that also I can cut and paste between. Unfortunately, it's only, as far as I can tell, it's only within a single, within a single project file. Project file. So if I have another map over here and I have my construction lines over here, I can go and paste it to another, another, layer but it only as far as i can tell it's only within a single a single project but that's a that's a good question the other thing you could do i guess is you could go and export a go to sharing and save it out as a layer file and then import that in to bring that into your project that's one thing you could do um, and that will bring it in and i think it will bring in all the templates also so to answer that question, um, is it exportable? Uh, there's some ways, some tricks you can do to go and, and export that. The question is, does the template work inside of Traverse tool? That's a good question. So if I have a Traverse here, all right, and I go and say, I want to go and let's turn this on. Let's go and say, um, construction lines. Yeah, I know. That's all right. Construction lines. All right. And I set my start. So what happens right here next to this is a template. Ooh, look at that. That will go and allow me to go and use my templates inside of here. So maybe I have parcel boundary. If I have multiple parcel lines tape. Now in the parcel fabric, you've got separate feature classes for that. But if you have a single feature class which had multiple symbology or multiple attribution on there, yes, it does work inside of here. And you can set them up this way. And then 45 degrees northeast for 200 feet. Boom, there you go. So what about this? Can I go and say, well, let's change this now to an easement. Let's go 90 degrees to that for 200 feet. Look at that. Yes. I got to tell you, these guys at Esri, they are listening to us. And this is such great enhancements. So yes, feature templates work inside of the Traverse tool. You just got to recognize that they're here under the templates. All right. Um, you can copy them inside the project file. You can export them out as a layer file. And I believe those templates do come in also. Did I answer all those questions? Uh, oh, I can see right now, Elise says, are feature templates new to 3.3? No. This is one of those things that often they've slipped these things in. Feature templates have been there from about release 1.5 it's been there a long time there's just 
you know, they don't talk about it a whole lot. I remember going at in, at 2.0 and looking at group templates, something well beyond what we're talking about here. But you can put together a template that goes and creates, when you create a line, it automatically creates other things associated with that line. So, yeah, they've been out there a long time. Um, once you get to learn them, like anything else in pro, it is such a rich environment now. And it just takes a while to sort of understand what they are and how to go and use them. Any other questions, Chris? That, I think, wraps it up. All right. Well, with that, let's go and say, let's hope, uh, thank you all for joining. I hope you enjoyed the workshop. Give us feedback. Stick around if you want to talk some more. All right. And uh, we'll see you next time.